Good evening again, and welcome for, the, uh, for those who are joining us for the first time uh, today or tonight. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight, um, tonight's event. Um, first, I will introduce um, Monica Schultz uh, from the Dayton Council of World Affairs, our partners for this conference tonight and for this event in particular. Uh, Monica will introduce our keynote. Thank you for joining us. The, the nature of the smaller size of a crowd makes a better conversations. Uh, we're really looking forward to have you. If you're on social media, don't hesitate to tweet using SPHR17 as the event hashtag. Um, and please ask questions. Thanks. All right, good evening, everybody. I hear the sessions have been really very interesting today, and I'm sure they will continue to be so. Uh, my name is Monica Schultz. As Yusuf mentioned, I am the president of the Dayton Council on World Affairs, and I am so excited to be here and as part of this event and honored, truly honored, to introduce our keynote speaker this evening, Maria Elena Incape. Hopefully I said that. Close enough. In Capia. As a child, um, Mary Elena immigrated to the United States with her family from Colombia. She went to school and eventually earned her Juris Doctorate de degree from Northwestern, I'm sorry, Northeastern University School of Law and began practicing as an attorney, primarily focused on employment law and soon leading immigrant workers' rights projects. In 2000, she joined the National Immigration Law Center as an attorney, again focused on labor and employment issues. She became their director of programs and now serves as their executive director where she leads the organization and through them uses a combination of litigation, policy, communications, and alliance building strategies as tools to affect social change. Along the way, she's been involved in many boards, also dealing with legal and immigrant issues, and has won several awards, several impressive awards for her leadership in this field. Mary Elena is an inspiration. She's an inspiration to me and hopefully to everybody here because of her hard work, her dedication, and her example of the American dream, an American dream that perhaps drew her family to the United States in the first place an American dream that says everyone has the chance to embrace the potential and opportunities available to them as a right and a freedom. I'm sure she'll tell you that there were many obstacles along the way, as there would be for anything that's important to achieve for. Uh, but tonight, during her keynote address titled Migrants Under Attack in the U.S. and the Road Toward Human Rights, I think she'll be sharing with us information about the growing blockade facing immigrants who come to America today. Because after all, who needs a wall when small-minded, ignorant fear of change can do so much more to destroy the very things that made the American dream? That's why this conference is so important. That's why your involvement today, tomorrow, Friday, and long into the future on this topic is so important. The Dayton Council on World Affairs also wants to be a part of affecting this change to reduce the barriers that are impacting the American dream for us all, including uh, human rights and immigration issues. Dayton Council on World Affairs, also known as DECAWA, is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization with 70 years of history for educating and engaging the Dayton community on global issues by sponsoring programs like this one, as well as hosting other conferences and programs on timely global issues. Earlier this year, we hosted, for example, a well-attended um, group of discussions on the rights of free speech hosted by the Turkish um, newspaper Zaman, the former editor of Zaman, uh, who is equivalent to the New York Times, who was ousted during the government coup. 
In addition, we work closely with many high school students in the greater Dayton area to educate and engage the leaders of tomorrow so that they understand how global issues like human rights and immigration impact Dayton, Ohio, as well as how Dayton, Ohio impacts global issues, because we do. The Dayton Council on World Affairs also believes that the more we understand the world around us, the better we will be positioned to meet the challenges ahead. And at the moment, it appears there are many challenges ahead, especially related to our relationship with the rest of the world, the people in it, and even the people right here in our own neighborhoods. Therefore, I invite you to join me in welcoming Mary Elena to tell us how we can help with these issues. Buenas noches. Wow, you didn't have any Colombian coffee with dinner. Buenas noches. Okay, all right. Thank you so much, Monica, for that introduction. And thank you to Youssef um, and everyone who has contributed to planning this very important conference. And thank you for spending Thursday evening um, with us, Wednesday evening. I have no sense of time these days. When we immigrated from Colombia, as Monica mentioned, um, my father and my mother, Arturo and Teresa, made immense personal sacrifices to leave Medellin, Colombia, and go to Central Falls, Rhode Island, where my father was recruited to work in the textile factories. My father was a guest worker. Um, he was brought because at the time, in the 1970s, being a textile worker was considered a skilled worker in the United States. The immigration laws were very different. It meant that my father first came on an immigration visa and an employment-based visa and was then able to go back and forth between Colombia and the United States. And then when he made the decision that raising 10 children in Colombia at a time of extreme poverty for our family and extreme violence, that this was the place where he did believe in that American dream, the immigration laws allowed for him to then petition for us. He first petitioned for an older brother, an older sister, and eventually in the days when there was no TSA, my mother traveled with six of us <laughs> to the United States, and we came with green cards, which was a very different experience from the experience of young children who are coming today, the so-called dreamers, which are no different than my experience. The only difference is I came with a piece of paper that allowed me and my dignity to be respected and for doors to be opened, for my family to be able to walk a pathway out of poverty and today to be contributing in so many different ways. Among my brothers and sisters today, um, despite the fact that my father had a second grade education, my mom had a fifth grade education, they instilled the importance of an education in us, the importance of education as an equalizer. They said very clearly to us, they would say, mija, la educación, nosotros no tenemos plata para dejarles, pero la educación es algo que nadie les puede quitar, right? Daughter, we don't have any material things to leave you, but an education is something that no one can ever take away. And today, despite the barriers that my older brothers and sisters who were teenagers when we immigrated, I have a sister who is a high school dropout who today is a biochemist. I have health professionals, physical therapists, teachers, uh, business, small business owners, right? We are all in different parts of civil society and contributing to this country. And I know for a fact that my family, just like millions of immigrants and refugees like us, are what makes America great. And it is because of this that for me, I feel so privileged to lead the National Immigration Law Center, an organization that was founded specifically to help low-income immigrant families like mine. We are working at the intersection of race, immigration status, and class. We believe that every individual, regardless of where we were born or how much money we have, have the same rights, right? That same opportunity and tools that they need to fulfill our full human potential, right? To be able to have a shot at that American dream, which continues to simply be a promise, a promise that today is more illusory than ever before, not just for migrants, frankly, it's true for many 
people who are struggling in this country, whether it's a white worker who is feeling economic pain, whether it is a black worker who is afraid of going out to the street because they're, they might be killed, whether it is an immigrant who is trying to make life um, survive in this new country, the country that they call home, like in Dayton, which is a welcoming city. I'm also conscious that if my family had migrated more recently, in the last decade, the last two decades, I would not be standing here before you. And the reason is that with my father's second grade education, my mother's fifth grade education, and our limited economic means, my family would be considered and labeled unworthy of being in the United States. And just think about that. When I think of my sister, who is a biochemist, who is trying to find solutions for cancer, the cancer that killed my mother, she deserves to be here. She is as worthy as any other scientist. Right? We at the National Immigration Law Center believe that no one's worth should ever be determined by where they were born by how much money we have, by who we decide to love, by when we decide to migrate, or when we are forced to migrate. And this is one of the reasons that I'm so honored to join you tonight, because in these dark times, your work as students of human rights, your work as human rights defenders, researchers, practitioners, is a bright, shining light on the path towards justice. We need every single person here to co-develop with us a new blueprint for society, a blueprint that counters that globalization of indifference that El Papa Francisco has talked about, right? He has called on us to reject that indifference, that disdain for humanity, and instead to work together and share responsibility in our collective futures. Because of this, the work that you're doing, the work that the Human Rights Center is doing to break systemic in patterns of injustices could not be more important um, at this time in history. The United States has long been considered a global leader on refugees, and the world is watching us now. And I have to say that as a lawyer and as a naturalized citizen, it is shameful to see what this country is doing, given our history. Embracing and welcoming refugees and migrants should be a bipartisan issue. It should be an issue that it doesn't matter if you are on the left, on the right, or everywhere in between, but everyone in every country should understand the benefits and the basic dignity and humanity of welcoming people who are seeking safety in other countries, people who are simply seeking a better life. It is a phenomenon of humanity. Since we exist as, hum as a human race, we have been migrating, and we will continue to migrate for many, many reasons. And in fact, our legal instruments right now internationally, especially human rights instruments, do not even recognize, are not even prepared for the types of migration, especially when you think about there is no such thing as an economic refugee. There is no such thing as an environmental refugee, right? Our laws don't prepare us for the new reality that we're currently living in and will be living in. Because at the end of the day, when we think about why we migrate, we are all on the same journey of life. Whether we are an African or a Middle Eastern refugee taking a boat to Europe, whether we are a Central American migrant taking a train called La Bestia to reach the United States, or whether you are making the difficult decision as a mother, for example, leaving Central America because you are afraid for your daughter's safety, because if you stay back home in Honduras, in El Salvador, in, um, in Guatemala, you know that your daughter, your 11-year-old daughter, will be kidnapped and raped, if not killed. And when you are a mother and you make the decision to walk for 25 days and walk north through the Americas until you reach the United States, we should not be detaining you. But that is what this country has been doing. And rather than opening our arms and saying, we, 
you have an international right as a refugee to be safe. We are saying, no, we are going to lock you up and victimize you even more. Victimize you through perhaps not giving you water or food or the health care that you need while you're in detention. Or even worse, engaging in sexual assault and rape by Border Patrol agents in the detention centers. Right? The level of victimization that is happening in our prisons of mothers and children who are fleeing violence and coming to the United States is horrific. When migrants leave their home country, and often, sometimes it's voluntarily, sometimes it's forced, they do so because we all are seeking the same thing in life, right? We all want to live with dignity and have the opportunity to fulfill our full human potential. We want to be safe, and we want to be with our loved ones, and we want to feel that we belong, that we belong to a local community, that we belong to a particular spiritual community, that we belong to the human race. It is that same promise of equality, freedom, and justice that all of today's migrants, whether they be from Colombia, like my family, whether they be from Haiti or Syria, whether they are Catholic, Muslim, Jewish, or other faiths, that is that same promise of equality, justice, and freedom that continue to be what people are migrating for and in search of. So as you gather here over the next few days, charting the frontiers of research and advocacy, know that we at the National Immigration Law Center are ready to partner with you because your work is more urgent and necessary than ever. These are challenging times. I don't have to tell anyone in this room. These are really dangerous times, and I don't say that lightly. Today, the United States is an increasingly dangerous place to live in if you are a migrant in search of a better life or wanting to reunite with your loved ones, if you are seeking safety from conflict, or if you are forced to migrate for political reasons, economic, environmental, or other factors such as criminal enterprises that are engaging in gender-based violence, especially in the Northern Triangle of Central America or criminal enterprises that are engaging in femicide, in enslavement of people. And this is especially true, this level of danger is especially true if you are poor, if you are black, if you are brown. And it's particularly troubling, not just for the United States, but frankly for the world as a whole, that we now have white supremacists that have infiltrated the highest levels of this government. These are individuals like Steve Bannon, Steve Miller, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who are, in they are intent on radically changing the direction of this country. They not only have a disdain for the legal instruments of human rights because they don't believe that the United States should even be signatory to our human rights declarations, but they have a disdain for immigrants' pure existence, their sheer existence, that they do not belong here, which is why I will share some of what is happening in terms of policy changes that this government um, is, in, uh, is embarking on. This is an administration that is intent on creating chaos and fear so that even though policies may not even be finalized, often the leak of an, a draft executive order is done with the intent to create fear. One of those examples is a draft executive order that was leaked in late January that basically said that any individual, not undocumented immigrants, right? Any individual who is here, undocumented, lawful permanent resident, a refugee, anyone who is a non-citizen could be considered a public charge if they accepted and received any kind of federal, state, or local public benefits. That was leaked to the press, and within days, do you know what that resulted in? That meant that a mother who had just given birth to a US citizen, three days old, walked into her local women, infant, and children's office, the WIC office, to say, I don't want to receive 
any food for my child. Please take me off of any government database because she was afraid that her child receiving the basic necessities of life at three days old, five weeks old, three months old would mean that she could be deported. And this wasn't an isolated case. We then had calls from a US citizen woman in her late 60s whose husband was a lawful permanent resident. He had a green card and they were receiving nutrition assistance because they were poor. And this US citizen woman went in to say, we don't want to receive any more food assistance. She was afraid her husband would not be able to become a citizen. And this is case after case after case, where now the American Association of Pediatrics has considered immigration as their top concern. Just think about that. Doctors who are taking care of children are saying that they are less concerned about asthma or diabetes or obesity or access to vaccines. They are more concerned about what immigration policies in this country are doing to children. Because at the beginning of this year, they saw a spike in doctor's offices, doctor's visits by children with anxiety attacks. They shared with me that they started seeing a pattern across the country with pediatricians who had notes on their medical records saying, fear of Trump. When you have a four-year-old being brought in to see a doctor because the family is afraid of the president of their country, and that is causing the level of trauma and anxiety that requires a doctor's visit, that should frighten all of us. The level of psychological trauma that is being caused on children, U.S. citizen children, whose parents are immigrants, who are one out of every fourth child in this country. Just think about that. One out of every four children in the United States has a parent who is an immigrant. This is our future, folks. If we do not stop and change the direction of this country, the children who are growing up today who are U.S. citizens, when they are teenagers, the level of medical and psychological needs that they will have because of the state violence that is being imposed on them and their families is something that is unprecedented and that we are not even prepared for as a country. Immediately after the elections in November, we at the National Immigration Law Center have been working around the clock. We've been working to ensure that local health care providers, educators, state and local governments, city leaders, folks like the welcoming communities, and immigrant families themselves have information, right? That they have accurate and timely information to make informed decisions about their future. This has also meant that since the elections, We've been working to ensure that we're leading the legal defense to the resistance in the courtrooms, in the halls of Congress, in state and local legislatures, city councils. And over the last 10 months, the courts have served as a very important um, balance, that check and balance that is so central to the democracy of the United States, where courts and, and judges, Republican and Democratic judges, all equally across the board saying no. There is no person in the United States that is above the law. The courts continue to serve as that important balance, check and balance against any um, actions that this administration has taken that have been seen as unlawful and extreme. This includes, for example, the first lawsuit that we filed, which we filed within hours of the first Muslim and refugee ban that was signed on Friday, January 27th. On Friday, during the day, we had received information and phone calls from the International Refugee Assistance Project, which is a refugee resettlement organization that works mostly with refugees from the Middle East. The first call we got was about an Afghani family, a family from Afghanistan that had been detained at San Francisco airport. By that time, we had a draft executive order, but it wasn't 
final, so we didn't know, but Afghanistan wasn't even listed on the, it wasn't one of the countries that was listed. We were fortunately able to work with the San Francisco airport agents to ensure that that family came in. The final executive order was issued at about 5.30 in the afternoon. And by 7.30, we received the first phone call from JFK Airport. And that was on behalf of Mr. Darwish. Mr. Darwish is a refugee from Iraq. He had, um, he came to be reunited with his family. He came with his, mo- his wife and children. After having served as an interpreter for the US military in Iraq, And because he served as an interpreter and assisted the U.S. military in his home country, he started receiving death threats. His whole family started receiving death threats. And he then applied for refugee status. It took over two years despite death threats. This extreme vetting we hear a lot about in the press now, that is exactly what the whole refugee process is, right? He went through multiple processes, national security background checks to be able to prove that he should qualify to enter the United States with a special immigrant visa. And so he was issued a visa. He was in transit while the executive order was finalized. Except that when he arrived at the JFK airport, what did the US government do? Handcuff him. Think about this. You are a courageous, family person, family man, who is traveling with your family. You have assisted the US government. You are one of the most patriotic people in the world who have assisted a foreign government against terrorists in your home country. That is how he saw what was happening. And instead, he arrives at JFK, is detained, and his wife and children were allowed in, which is how we learned of what had happened. And then we learn about Mr. Al-Shawi, who was a second person who was detained in similar conditions. I contacted, our legal director um, notified me about what was happening. We were naive and we thought, let's just call the Department of Homeland Security. We should definitely be able to get them to come in. Um, he had, he was already approved for a visa. The family had all the documentation, et cetera. Well, by 11.30 p.m. on Friday night, We were told by the Border Patrol that they hadn't even reviewed the executive order. They had no guidance. They would not be issuing any guidance until they finished reviewing it. That might happen at the end of the weekend. Take a look at the website sometime tomorrow, maybe 6 a.m., and we can check in later. And at that point, I gave a green light to our legal director to file the lawsuit. We filed this first lawsuit on behalf of Mr. Darwish and Mr. Al-Shawi, who, again, In my mind, they are today's human rights defenders in this country. They won the first legal victory of any migrant or refugee against this administration. Frankly, it was actually the first legal victory of any anybody in this country against this administration, which on that Saturday night in an emergency hearing, the federal court said no. The federal government cannot stop people at airports in any part of the country who were arriving and who had a legal right to arrive, who had visas in their hands, who had been approved. A couple of weeks later, we then filed a lawsuit in Maryland on behalf of uh, a number of other refugee resettlement organizations. IRAP was one of them, the International Refugee Assistance Project, HIAS, which is a Jewish refugee resettlement, and a number of individuals from different countries that were banned under the Muslim and refugee ban. We filed that lawsuit. That was the first executive order. We are now on Muslim ban 4.0. The Trump administration has consistently tried to revise the executive orders to try to get around the different court decisions that have come down. And again, These are not political decisions. These are federal court decisions in Maryland, which is our case in the Fourth Circuit, in Hawaii, in California, across the country by both Republican and Democratically appointed judges, all saying the same thing. We in this country do not discriminate based on religious liberty. We in this country do not discriminate based on national origin. Our Constitution forbids that. And because of that, we have been able to stop the Muslim and refugee ban from being implemented. And we at the National Immigration Law Center are committed in following the lead of our Muslim, Arab, and South Asian community partners. We are committed to continuing to fight in the courts 
because we believe that should, there should never be any Muslim ban in this country. And those partners in that lawsuit, in the Muslim ban lawsuit, are part of the human rights defending community. Separately, we also filed a lawsuit just weeks later on behalf of Daniela Vargas. Dani, which is the name she uses, Dani is a young woman from Argentina. She came when she was seven years old to the United States with her parents, lives in Mississippi. You listen to Dani, she is as Southern as Southerners sound like, with the Southern drawl. <laughs> um, and she, the United States is home, this is what she knows. Dani was fortunate to be able to receive temporary protection from deportation through the DACA program, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. DACA, for those of you who may or may not be familiar with it, is a program that frankly I believe is probably one of the most important public policy victories in this country in recent decades. And I say that because this was a change in policy that was brought about by young people, right? The people who were directly impacted by the inhumane immigration laws. It was young, young immigrants themselves and allies like our organization who fought for and won a change in policy. For the last five years, over 800,000 young immigrants have had a life transformative effect because they received a document from the federal government that said, you belong. That gave them the right to go to school here. Perhaps you have some DACA students here at the University of Dayton. That gave them the right to work in the United States. And frankly, that gave them a sense of dignity. I mean, I remember with some of the first DACA students when they received their work authorization document, what it meant to them. It was less about the legal opportunities and rights that, and the doors that had opened, it was more about just their sense of humanity, that I now have a government-issued document with my picture on it and my name that says I'm a human being. And that is what this fight is about. Just like Danny, and the reason we represent Danny is because unfortunately, her father and brother were detained by immigration agents in Mississippi. And Danny was very courageous and spoke at a press conference about what had happened to her brother and, fa and father. And two blocks after, so she did her press conference and left, and she was in the passenger side. Two blocks later, they're stopped by an unmarked car, which ends up being immigration agents. They didn't even go to the driver's side. They went straight to the passenger side, and they said, you know who we are, get out of the car. And immigration agents detained her in retaliation for having spoken publicly against them detaining her father and brother. Now, Danny had DACA. She was waiting for her renewal document. She had lawful authority to be in the United States. That didn't matter to immigration agents. They still detained her. Not too long ago, in August, many of you may have heard about Rixi, um, Enriquez Perdomo, who is a local um, young woman with DACA that lives in Louisville, Kentucky, or in the Louisville, Kentucky area. And we at the National Immigration Law Center worked with organizers and advocates from Cleveland, Ohio, and Northern Kentucky to get Rixie out of detention. What happened to Rixie? Mother of a young um, US citizen child. He was not even a year old when she was detained. She had a church member who was detained by immigration agents. And no one in her community had legal status. And so she very courageously said, I will go to the local immigration office. And they collected money so that she, they could pay bond and get this church member out of detention. And Rixie shows up at the local immigration office. And what happens? Instead, they detain her. And they said, oh, no. Yep, you have DACA, that doesn't matter anymore. President Trump is now president, that, that doesn't matter. This was before President Trump even terminated the program. This was in the summer months. Rixie was detained and then transferred to four different prisons to keep her lawyer, her local immigration lawyer, and her family from getting access to her. And it was only through a lot of advocacy 
in combination with the local lawyer and organizers and advocates, our work at the national level and the press, that finally Rixi was released from prison after having been unlawfully detained. Daniela in Mississippi was in jail. She was sent to, um, to Louisiana to a prison for a month despite being unlawfully detained. And these are people like Daniela and Rixi are the human rights defenders of today. They are the reason that we at the National Immigration Law Center are fighting so hard to get the DREAM Act passed by the end of this year. We are working and following the leadership of young so-called dreamers to make sure that Congress acts as courageously as these young leaders are doing. We also filed within a couple of hours of President Trump announcing that he was ending the DACA program. We filed a lawsuit in New York on behalf of Martin Batalla Vidal. Martin is a young Queens. You could not get any more New Yorker than Martin. <laughs> I wish I could do accents because, but I can't. Um, you listen to Martin and you're like, oh boy, okay. <laughs> you're like that, I, I, you know what that New York accent is like. Um, and Martin has been in the United States since he was a child. Um, he is from Mexico. He is very proud. Queens or Queensonian, I don't know what they call themselves. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, um, Martin has been receiving a ton of anti-immigrant and uh, homophobic hate messages and threats because he filed this lawsuit, um, which is a class action lawsuit on behalf of all the 800,000 young immigrants like Martin, like Rixie, like Danny, who are at risk of losing their DACA status, that protection from deportation, unless Congress acts and unless the courts prevent the program from being terminated. So in our mind, Martin is another human rights defender of today. And lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't remind us that these human rights violations in the United States did not start in November with President Trump. Like many of you in the room, we at the National Immigration Law Center have been fighting human rights abuses in the United States against migrants, and particularly against low-income immigrants under the Obama administration. We've been fighting human rights violations not only by the federal government, but by state governments and local governments. An example of the federal government is human rights defender Jane Doe, who, for her privacy, we aren't able to use her real name in the lawsuit, but Jane Doe is a young woman who came from Central America and was detained in Las Hieleras. Las Hieleras are ice boxes. That's what it translates into in English. And they're called ice boxes because that is what the prison at the border is like. People are detained in inhumane and unlawful conditions. They are ice boxes and they are purposefully kept so cold that people get ill, that people can't survive. They are um, there is basically psychological warfare, their level of keeping the lights on all day, 24 hours of day, so people can't sleep. Um, again, the lack of food, the lack of anything, and they are being kept literally like sardines and person by person by person, sleeping on the, on the ground, on cement ground, in, again, an ice box, uh, underneath. I mean, if you saw the pictures of what these detention centers, these prisons look like, people are literally sleeping on the floor right next to a toilet because there is no room, there aren't any beds. And so Jane Doe represents all the hundreds of thousands of migrants like her who have been detained at the Tucson, Arizona sector, which is where our lawsuit is based. We also represent um, Victor uh, Van Ho who sued the state of Louisiana for a, a lawsuit, a, a change in law that then Governor Bobby Jindal passed which basically said that migrants in Louisiana could not get a, legal, a, a license to get married unless they presented certain documents, including a social security card. Now, Victor is a US citizen. He was born on a refugee camp back in the day, when he was, when, before he came to the United States, he was born in a refugee camp. And because he was born in a refugee camp, he didn't have a birth certificate, the same way many of you are born at a hospital. The type of documents Louisiana was requiring of migrants was basically meant to keep them from getting married to someone and then having that person become a permanent resident or a citizen in the United States. This was a case that was filed even after the Supreme Court had ruled that 
in the United States, regardless of your sexual orientation, you have a right to get married. You have a right to love whoever you want to love. But Louisiana, even after that law, after that decision by the Supreme Court said, oh no, that doesn't apply here. It doesn't apply to migrants at least. And that is why Victor is one of the human rights defenders. And then lastly, we actually represent um, Project South, who I know Azadeh was here at the plenary today. Um, we represent Project South, the NAACP in Georgia, and a number of individuals, both African American and Latino immigrants in LaGrange, Georgia, which has a policy which, frankly, we believe is probably widespread across the country in small communities across the South especially, which make it basically illegal for people to receive basic human needs such as water, electricity, and gas. If you don't have a social security number, you don't have a right to those things. If you have a um, you are stopped for driving without a license or some traffic violation and you have an outstanding um, ticket, you don't have a right to water in LaGrange, Georgia. And that is why we filed this lawsuit on behalf of poor black and immigrants in LaGrange because it is those human rights violations that we are saying we will not allow those to stand. And it's that those courageous actions by people, right, everyday people who are human rights defenders, who are the ones who are helping us ensure that that promise of the American dream, that that promise of what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says we all have an inalienable right to, we have to fight for that. But it takes courage. It takes individual actions. It takes steps by individual people who are willing to take a risk. And again, that is why your work is so important here, because I can say, as researchers, for those of you who are doing the research part of it, we don't need your human rights papers to collect dust or to only be read by other researchers. You to serve as experts in our court cases. We need you to serve as experts on Capitol Hill before congressional hearings, at city council hearings. We need you to work with us to inform our legal theories and vice versa for us to inform your research and your work. Together, we have to work together. We need each other because the current state of affairs in the United States is not one that is sustainable. The attacks on migrants are not an attack on migrants only. Yes, of course, that is the immediate impact. But the attack on migrants is actually an attack on the United States identity. It's an attack on the soul of this nation, about what it means to be American, how we define who is worthy of being an American in the future. And that is why this fight is so important. And I thank you for the work that you're doing every single day. And I look forward to partnering with, to partnering with you and, of course, to answering any questions you have. Gracias. Getting a mic. We'll start with Roxana. <laughs> One thing um, in U.S. litigation that I think is a challenge is to use international treaties and international human rights obligations to develop some of the arguments that that you're that you've identified. So I'm wondering to what extent is Karen, who please say hi to me <laughs> for me, Roxana and, knows our director, <laughs> and others who who work in your organizations and the lawyers who work for other organizations try to incorporate international sources of law mm -hmm. into their litigation and if they don't, why not? Yep. It's an excellent question, Roxana. So this is actually I think even a greater Question, Roxana, so I'll answer it specifically with respect to litigation, but actually I, I want to make a larger point first. And the larger point, and I think all of you who are here and care about human rights, I'm not saying anything you don't know, which is in the United States, particularly in the legal and political spheres, people do not care about human rights. Policymakers do not, right? The first thing you hear, I remember the first time we started doing work in um, state legislatures or Congress was like, oh no, don't raise human rights issues. That, that's, a, that's a thing that happens in other countries. That doesn't happen here. And it has almost no legal weight. I mean, just being completely honest. 
But that is actually why we are in the state that we are in the United States, because there isn't, to begin with, a shared understanding, like basic information about what are our human rights. And in fact, oftentimes migrants come to the United States with more knowledge about their human rights than people who grow up in the United States. So I would say actually the first thing is, and this is why, again, I think the work that you are all doing is so important. We have to change that. We have to change that from the ground up. We have to change the ability for us to talk about human rights. And I, and I believe that when things get as bad as they have gotten, and unfortunately, we are only in year one, not even a full year, things will get worse. I can guarantee you things are getting worse every single day. And there are many things that we don't even know are happening, are being policies that are being uh, created. And so we have an opportunity, I think, over the next three years to really use a human rights frame to help change the direction of this country and to start using the legal instruments in the courts in local, at the city council, I mean, at the very, very local level, at city council, board of supervisor hearings, congressional hearings, even in the court of public opinion. So for those of you who are pub publishing papers on human rights, take that 25, 50, 100 page paper, turn it into a shorter, more accessible piece that might then become an op-ed that gets published in your local newspaper. Start a conversation, do a blog, do, you know, write, write your beautiful research in ways that can reach the masses, because that is actually what I think is what's gonna change the direction and the path that we need in this country. And on the litigation front in particular, we use the, the, the arguments mostly when we're in amici, right? When we are what's called a friend of the court, when we're filing a brief on amicus curiae, which is a Latin term, um, because we're not a party to the lawsuit. But again, most of the violations that we have in, and we're filing most, most of our lawsuits are in federal court, they're not looking to, they're not making decisions based on human rights um, laws, but on, but, but we'll make the argument more from the framework perspective, but less so in terms of what is actually going to reach a decision that changes the outcome for the individuals or that strikes down the Muslim ban as un, un, unconstitutional, for example. So hope that answers the question. Um, hi, my name is Shana Plout, and I'm originally from the States, but I've been actually living in Canada for the past uh, over eight years now. Mm -hmm. So in, in some ways, I, I feel like I, I bring a, a unique perspective because I'm living in a country that has a completely different approach mm -hmm. to, um, uh, to immigration. Mm -hmm. And so I have two questions. Uh, one you actually just began a little bit, which is what is the role of public pedagogy? Mm -hmm. And public pedagogy, my, my academic work as well as my, my other journalistic work is that of human rights journalism. So what is the role of public pedagogy in a way that can help um, not only highlight what the problems are, but also highlight possible solutions? Absolutely. So if, if we could yeah. speak about yeah. that in more mm -hmm. depth. And then secondly, one of the things that um, Canada often is held up for is the very um, positive approach to, to immigration. I am a benefit of it. I'm now a dual citizen mm -hmm. uh, as of February. However, one of the things that happens is that it's a um, desire for a particular kind of immigrant uh, with particular social and economic capital. Mm -hmm. And whereas the U.S. is actually seen as being more humanitarian because of family class. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering um, what your thoughts are as President Trump keeps looking towards Canada and saying, no, 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 we want to actually follow Canada, you know, Canada's policy and where we can see the problems in Canada's mm -hmm. policy, how you are seeing this strategic use mm -hmm. <laughs> um, of the immigrant yeah. in that yep. sense. Great questions. So on the public pedagogy first, and I'll say um, as a lawyer, it's something that's new, right? We at the National Immigration Law Center have historically used the courts, litigation, and then the legislative and administrative policy making process. And it's only been in the last seven years that we really have taken on the public discourse as a, a central tenet to that because we're realizing that we can win a lawsuit, but that's not changing hearts and minds. That's not changing behavior. And ultimately, it's not creating the social change, the lasting social change because with DACA is the perfect example. We worked hard to 
convince President Obama to use his executive authority, then in comes the next president, it's done away with, right? So the, the lasting change I am a converted believer in, it's probably the most important thing. And I think as human rights journalism especially ag agree, I think the problems, highlighting what the problems are, but the more important piece is hi highlighting the solutions and also sharing examples from different parts of the world in which there are different solutions and different approaches to problems that I think are really critical. Um, I think especially um, one other example with Canada, I think if you uh, or colleagues in Canada were to write about what are the challenges with the Canadian migration system when it doesn't take into account the family-based visas um, and reunifica reunification of families and the, the impact that that has, that would actually be very, um, very, very possible and persuasive, very powerful and persuasive to the U.S. debate to show, wait, you're looking to Canada? Here are the downsides of that system. And I actually do believe that um, not only, it's really less President Trump, it's actually Steve Miller um, and Jeff Sessions and others um, in the administration that radically want to change the face of America and change who can come in the future. And they are very much looking at what's called a merit-based system, which would do away. And in fact, the kind of, one of the reasons I missed today was because I had a meeting, a last minute meeting scheduled with Senate Democratic leader Schumer and from New York and Durbin from Illinois and Representative Pelosi from California. And part of what we are hearing is that in exchange for the DREAM Act, what Republicans are starting to ask for is ending what they call chain migration, which all chain migration is family reunification. It's being able to petition for your parent or for siblings, et cetera, which is how most of us come to the United States. And you need a balance, right? You can't only have people coming in on work-based visas and then leaving their families behind. That creates other social problems in local communities that then are left behind. Um, so I would really encourage you and happy to talk to you later about ways that you and Canadian and colleagues and people from other parts of the world could use this moment to inject your voice about some of those solutions and some of those challenges. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I've been part of the immigrants' rights movement since the 80s, the sanctuary, earlier sanctuary movement. Um, and it's been a really exciting time since 2010 mm -hmm. as we've shifted from a more, you know, pleading to please let us have citizenship and yep. to a more confrontational and uh, I think dignified mm -hmm. sort of claiming of space, yep. claiming of rights and so on. But I'm wondering what your ideas are about how to how to strategically frame and what tactics will work in the movement right now yep. with the shift to the Trump era. Yeah. Because I'm kind of at a loss. I don't know what narratives are gonna work that won't simultaneously reinforce other really problematic things mm -hmm. like American exceptionalism and yeah. whatnot. And I don't know how to um, maintain a sense of energy and joy when so many of us are despairing yes. <laughs> about it completely understand that sense of despair these days are hard. And um, I guess I, a couple of things on the, the work that you and others did in the 1980s, which is really the groundwork for the incredible organizing happening today. Uh, and actually also that many of today's young immigrant leaders are learning from the organizing that happened not only in the 1980s, but in the 1950s and 60s from civil rights elders, right? So today we had a meeting with um, so-called dreamers, right, young immigrant leaders, and someone who is helping to um, develop the legacy project of SNCC um, in the you know, pre-civil rights era and the role of young, of young African-American leaders um, in, in the civil rights era. Like that, that is critical, and making those connections is critical. I think on the messaging, I would really start from a human rights framework, right? Because I think that is one part of what's missing and part of what needs to be introduced for the long haul. Because in a time of such darkness in the United States, in a time of such danger, we have to stay focused on the long term, right? We have immediate fires to put out. I just shared a bunch that we're putting out through the courts and otherwise. Um, but it's really important to keep our eye on the prize of what is the kind of society that we're trying to build. And I think the messaging has to be one of inclusivity, one of inclusivity and equity so that we're not pitting one community against the other. It isn't about let's have a pro-immigrant policy that then 
has um, unintended consequences on poor whites and blacks and, and second or third generation uh, immigrants. Um, we need to make sure that we're not using language of immigrants are hard workers. Immigrants are not criminals, right? You hear that a lot. Why do you think that is not a good thing? Because immigrants are not criminals means someone else is a criminal. Immigrants are hardworking means someone else is not. And in the United States, those are code for blacks are lazy, blacks are criminals. And we cannot allow that. We can't perpetuate messaging that actually is damaging to other people without understanding that what this, at the end of the day, what this, is, this fight is all about is racism and class. And that we need to create policies, frankly, that unite us and that lift the floor for everyone, which is at the core of human rights, which is why I do think that human rights terminology and framework is the messaging that we have to be putting out there, because it is about all of us. Thank you. Um, a bit of a hypothetical question, mm -hmm. and this is a pre- I feel like I'm back in law school. <laughs> Pre-Trump, pre-Trump, uh -huh. when there was talk, serious talk, about potential comprehensive immigration mm -hmm. reforms and what kind of legalization um, uh, process would that entail. One proposal that was thought that people who would ordinarily, members of Congress who might ordinarily be very skeptical might buy is if those you know, whatever criteria were met um, that were uh, undocumented could actually get legal status, but they could never become a U.S. citizen. Yeah. Okay, well, a lot of people would say, gee, that creates another marginalized population, mm -hmm. right? So, on the other hand, that was then, today, be something different. But I guess, let's say something like that passed, mm -hmm. okay? So you pass a... Uh, from the point of view of many immigrant ad advocates, a really inadequate immigration reform that does some good but Lots leaves a lot to be desired, mm -hmm. okay? Um, what is the possibility of then organizations like yourself um, mounting lawsuits or Congress then amending it in more positive ways? That's, those are excellent questions and actually not hypotheticals because... In 2013, which was the last time that there were very serious uh, negotiations happening on federal legislative reform, um, that was, uh, it was ideas, but it actually never made it into an actual proposal. Um, and what's important about your question is that advocates were against it, but when you actually talk to immigrants in communities, for immigrants, most immigrants were saying, we care about three things. Because remember, during the Obama administration, we had record numbers of deportations. And so for immigrants that were afraid of de being detained or deported, which is as bad as it was back then, it's a very different level of psychological warfare that's happening right now. But the fact was that there was a risk of being detained and deported until Obama changed those policies as well. Um, but when you ask immigrants themselves, they wanted three things. They wanted to be able to work lawfully. They wanted to be able to drive. They wanted to be able to travel to visit their families, especially go back home if a family member was ill. Because there's no nothing more heartbreaking than the number of immigrants who have lost their parents or other loved ones and weren't able to travel back home to be with them in their last days. And so if we had really listened to immigrants themselves rather than immigrant advocates, we may have ended with that kind of a policy. Just so you know, our process, because we're a legal advocacy organization, we absolutely, whenever we're working on legislation, we're also looking at, can we draft this in a way that we then can sue over it? Right? And so being very strategic, like, yes, if this is going to get into the books, it's better to have something that's really bad that we know we're going to be able to sue over than something that is less bad and, frankly, you know, we won't be able to challenge in the courts. And so there are very strategic decisions like that that are not very public that we don't share, but it is part of what goes into our, our advocacy and our thinking, um, for sure. And right now, I mean, look, to be completely honest, because we're immersed in the DREAM Act negotiations, um, if we do our work because it's going to take a village, I do believe that we will get the DREAM Act by the end of the year. Now, 
what kind of a dream act, at what cost, what expense, that's the big question. And that's part of what we're, why we're fighting so hard for it to be just a dream act and not at the expense of immigrant youth's parents or other communities, border militarization, et cetera. Um, but we also know that if we get the DREAM Act passed, that will pro provide a, a baseline to then get immigration reform for other communities, probably not in 2018 because it's another election year, um, but probably closer to 2019 or after the next presidential election. In the meantime, we believe that immigration reform can happen and is happening from the bottom up. And what I mean by that is that we at the National Immigration Law Center for years now have been working with local advocates and organizers uh, in communities across the country to change policies because it's not just about achieving citizenship. I mean, let's be real. African Americans have citizenship in this country and they still don't have equity in this country and they still are being killed. Um, poor people, who of any race still don't have access to like basic health care and subsistence and the nutrition that they need and the jobs and opportunities that they need. So citizenship alone doesn't do it. That is where we need human rights, right? Like what are the things, what are the policy changes that we need to make sure that people have, um, that their lives, their day-to-day -day lives can be improved? That includes welcoming communities, right? The ability to change a local community's functioning so that people are respected and valued and seen for who they really are and all of the skill sets and richness that they bring, their culture, et cetera, that is a local policy change. Um, for the last three, four years we've been working on, we've achieved 40% of immigrants now live in a state that provides access to driver's licenses. We should be able to get 100%. Frankly, it's like has nothing to do with immigration, why somebody should have a driver's license. It benefits all of us um, for people to who are driving to have pass a test and to have insurance, and it benefits the insurance companies and the car companies. Um, similar, 75% of students now live in a state that provides tuition equity or access to financial aid. So all of those changes, we have to continue doing those, even if we had immigration reform. And so I would hope that at the local level, all of you continue working on those kinds of policy changes as well. Anything else? Yeah. Hi, um, Marilena. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Tony Talbot from uh, University of Dayton Human Rights Center. Uh, thank you for a very inspiring talk. Thank and you. then building off the answer, the questions and the answers right now, but slightly moving maybe a little bit laterally. Um, as advocates, um, could you give us some advice or what you would like to see or what would make your like your work easier uh, for us um, to engage the public sector mm -hmm. in trying to enact a more sensible immigration policy in the U.S., especially mobilizing business and business leaders to do so. Antonio, is your question specifically from the Human Rights Center perspective or more broadly what folks can do? Um, more broadly okay, what, great. what folks can do. So yes, look, this is not a, the, the level of change that's needed and the, the shift in direction that's needed in this country needs all stakeholders, right? It needs, obviously, students, universities. Universities are playing an important role. Educators are extremely important. So I would say in the public sector, educators, health professionals, and then businesses, right? I mean, businesses who understand and see the immediate benefit of a worker skill set um, and that they have, um, one, connections to policymakers that many of us do not. Um, they can speak in a language that allows policymakers to see why this is beneficial. Look, at the end of the day, I would much more, I would prefer that policymakers, whether they be in the White House, Senate, House, City Council, State Legislature, that they're making decisions based on a human rights framework. That would be the ideal. But, if they are not buying our human rights and civil rights arguments at the very least, then if their economic arguments help to win the day, that is also helpful. And so I think as long as those economic arguments are not undermining or creating a sense of immigrants as a commodity or things like that, right, that that's the thing. But the business community right now on the DREAM Act, for example, out in full force, right? They are engaged in the lawsuits. They are filing amicus briefs. They are putting a ton of money. Um, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook, they are investing millions of dollars in the legislative fight to try to get the DREAM Act passed. Um, so 
We can't underestimate the importance of a local business leader, especially in a place like Ohio or Kentucky or Kansas, to speak, you know, to do an op-ed, right, as a local uh, chamber of commerce to say, Immigrants are welcome here. And here are, I was talking to Monica earlier about Dayton and her community, you know, for people in other parts of the country to learn and hear about the richness and the benefits of immigrant communities rather than this, um, this foreign concept people have and this fear that the Trump administration and others have been so good at tapping into of this fear of the other and this notion of what will happen if migrants come to our community. And so business leaders, but the public sector in many different arenas have a very important role um, to play in that, as active as actually engaging policymakers, helping to draft the policy changes, um, but even from just being a spokesperson on these different issues. Thanks, Tony. Thank you so much for a really wonderful presentation Thank and for you. all of your work. My question is only also in framing and mm. instrumentalization. So mm -hmm. part of my role is to translate research into policy and practice, Excellent. particularly at the intersection of feminism and immigration and forced migration. And a lot of what we're hearing, particularly because we're doing research in neoliberal funding regimes, mm -hmm. is to frame immigration in, in terms of national security, mm. in terms of what is at the benefit of the United States, and we worry about that because it's be instrumentalizing immigration mm. to reinforce a narrative that's damaging. Yeah. And so my question for you is, how useful is the American dream and how mm -hmm. useful is yeah. it to frame immigration yeah. in terms of something that's been built on the basis of exclusion mm -hmm. and of otherness? Mm -hmm. And I understand the instrumental benefits of making people feel like it's useful to them or belonging mm -hmm. or making it seem not threatening. Yeah. But in the long run, isn't the the opposite of a yep. human rights yep. framework. Excellent question, and I'm so glad that you're questioning that, especially given the role that you're playing. So a couple of things. I'm gonna start with the American dream first because I, I think as immigrants, right, and as myself as an immigrant, right, that is part of the reason that my parents came, right? This notion of the American dream, as you are in the, as I've been in the United States and have grown up here now and have learned about how the country was founded and not just the exclusionary and otherness, but frankly, you know, just enslavement and genocide. Um, this notion of the American dream is why I said earlier it's illusory, right? And, um, and I do think we need new language, right? We need a way to capture, um, to be able to capture what that is trying to tap into. Um, for example, I think back to the message and the other messaging we definitely stay away from is we are a country, a nation of immigrants. We are not a nation of immigrants. We are a nation of indigenous peoples that have, ne have been killed off. We are a nation of slaves that helped to found, right? That was the labor that was used to build this country. And yes, aside from indigenous people and uh, the, the survivors and, and children and ancestors of um, uh, the children of slaves, then the rest of us have come through you know, different um, migration patterns, but still some forced migration even today. Um, and so really under, I think, being self-critical and, and learning and changing, right? And changing the language. Um, and so I think that that's one where some of the intersectional work between the movement for black lives and immigrant justice communities really starting to talk through how do we change that? National security is another one that absolutely does not benefit us. And in fact, we're seeing the impact on Masa communities, right? Muslim, Arab, and South Asian communities especially being impacted by that. And you see it right now when you look at what happened, the tragic events in Las Vegas, the tragic events in San Antonio earlier this week. Um, the mass violence that we have, that when it's perpetrated by a white person, is mass violence. And we are not even talking about gun, gun violence. But yet, you have a Muslim who allegedly, I think, used his truck to uh, commit a crime and killed uh, seven, eight people in New York. Because he was a Muslim, it then became national security, right? And it's, and then, he came on a, on a diversity visa, and so we're going to work on ending diversity visas, which diversity visas is the main way that African immigrants are able to enter the United States. So let's make no mistake about it. It's both an anti-Muslim um, approach that policymakers are taking, but it's also an anti-blackness 
Um, and so we absolutely need to change that. And there's a knee-jerk reaction because of 9-11 to shape and talk about everything as a national security, and we have to undo that. And I think the first responsibility is not using it, and then the second is really thinking creatively. And again, this is where our work together becomes so critical. How do we develop that new terminology? What is that? Because there is a, there is a very basic human need to be safe, and that's important. We want safety. We all want safety, and we deserve to be safe, right? That is part of our human rights. Um, but there's a difference between how are we safe versus how the, the, the nation state claims of, you know, of, of what safety is and when it's only about the nation's security while the rest of us are living very insecure lives and oftentimes um, violence and state um, insecurity being uh, perpetrated by the state itself. So really great questions. Thank you for your thinking on that. Um, it's 8.45, so we'll take one more question. I'm going to take the last question from my colleague from, Colum from Colombia. <laughs> Thank you. Gracias, Marianela. Eh, la pregunta es, um, escucho que eh, hay diferentes leyes locales y diferentes estrategias de, um, de trato a, a la población migrante. Uh -huh. La pregunta está en redes locales o una forma de trabajo local que repita experiencias en uno y otro lugar y que permita de alguna forma articularse como organización social, como redes de organizaciones uh -huh. sociales. Igual, todos aquí son o vienen de migrantes. Entonces, eh, la posibilidad de construcción y de fortalecimiento de redes locales, ¿cómo la han trabajado? Uh -huh. Muy buena pregunta. So the question was... Um, that she understands that there are lots of different laws, both local um, policies, state policies that impact migrants. And the question is, is there a possibility for there to be strengthening of networks um, at the local level for there to be increased protections of migrants and have that be replicated? And you know, how is that playing out in the United States? Entonces, se va a contestar primero en español. Um, muy importante tu pregunta. Y sabes que apenas yo diría que en los últimos... Siete años eh, y quizás más como cinco años es que estamos viendo la necesidad más que todo porque en el 2010 se, se vivió en este país una ola de leyes locales y estatales antimigrantes en Arizona, Alabama y otros estados más que todos en el sur. So I'm starting by sharing that um, that in the last five, seven years is really where we have begun to see much more. And this is where I was sharing before that bottom up organizing immigration reform from the bottom up. And that was mostly in response to the anti-immigrant um, policies at the state and local level, such as Arizona, Alabama's um, anti-immigrant laws. And after that, there was then a shift to, we can't simply sue those states as the answer. We actually need to organize and we need to change and create affirmative pro-immigrant and inclusive policies. Entonces, lo que, lo que ocurrió en ese tiempo, estábamos demandando cuando habían estas leyes anti-inmigrantes, pero las organizaciones de comunidad, la, las comunidades de base eh, decidieron que no. La, la, aunque podíamos demandar, lo que neces se necesitaba en realidad era poder organizar, crear esa, esa, esa red a nivel um, local y crear, cambiar las leyes eh, locales y estatales que fueran más pro-inmigrante, pero en realidad que beneficiara a la comunidad en general. Y desde eso se han estado formando redes. Um, hay veces basado en, en, en el área, por ejemplo, el, el hecho de una, tener una licencia de manejar en este país es muy necesario, eh, pero también es una forma de identidad que los inmigrantes no tienen. Entonces hay una red que se ha estado enfocando en eso, donde se, se están tratando de replicar y duplicar el trabajo organizativo y el, cam y el cambio de leyes también, exacto, y el acceso. Um, so I was just given an example of where some of the places we've been engaged in is in terms of um, access to driver's license, so that there has been a network of state and local organizers and advocates sharing that information so that as people are winning a fight on access to driver's license in uh, California, then folks in... Uh, I'm trying to think of who was the most recent, um, Illinois, which was limited, um, you know, are, are learning from each other. And in fact, one of the things, and maybe I'll close because um, I can see Yousef, <laughs> is that we are doing um, 
is that in 2018, we're launching a state and local initiative, which is really a long-term approach. And actually, I think this is one of the places where we could do some joint work as well in terms of policy development from a human rights framework is how do we take some of these ideas at the local level, convert them into policy changes, but then have the peer learning that happens and the organizing that needs to happen to be able to accelerate the change at a, at a much um, a, a deeper level in terms of everything from access to healthcare to education, but really that communities themselves are leading what those priorities are. Y finalmente, um, estaba compartiendo que nosotros en el 2018, ahorita en la, a la vuelta de unos meses, vamos a crear una iniciativa a nivel nacional, pero que está enfocada específicamente en cómo las comunidades locales y estatales pueden formar esas redes, no solamente basado en un tema, sino trabajando juntas para tratar de cambiar las leyes, pero más que todo es tratar de crear fuentes organizativas mucho más eh, unidas, solidarias, pero basadas en acción y acceso a los diferentes, bien sea acceso a la educación, a, a la salud, que es un problema muy, muy grande aquí para los inmigrantes también, um, de una manera que se pueda eh, acelerar el cambio eh, social, más que todo. Gracias por tu pregunta. Excellent. Thank you. Can we give a round? Sí, se puede. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you.